Welcome to the Between Two Wheels podcast, where we talk about all things on and between two wheels. I'm your host, Johnny, dragging my feet on buying a dirt bike roadblock. And you all know my co-host, Justin, new truck, who dis, bird, and Uncle Team Bradley is actually sitting in for me, Ken. <laughs> this episode's being brought to you by Get Lowered Cycles, your one-stop shop for all things Harley and Harley related, and Nutsack, the last EDC bag you will ever want or need. On today's episode... We are covering the fans' suggested topics. What's going on, guys? Uh, <laughs> that kind of day? Uh, that kind of week. Yeah. New truck took up my entire week. Yeah? Yeah, I'm, I mean, it's by choice. I'm doing stupid, you know, stuff to it, but... Like what? Just vinyl wrap, some stuff, and you'll see. It's outside. Is there a video to... Uh Go along with it. Hell no. <laughs> no. Not doing a new same series? Thing, no, same thing with my Camaro. This is my get to work on it and not to worry about, you know, shooting anything. Yeah. Vehicle, so. Team Bradley, welcome back. You have a microphone this time. Congratulations. Unfortunately. I know, yay. <laughs> Promotions. He was asking what kind of pranks we're going to uh, play on him. I was like, I didn't have anything planned. He's like, well, you don't usually do. I was like... <laughs> Ken wanted us to have you like come and sit down like right before the episode starts. Just move the mic away from you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, Justin, you put out, was it on Instagram and Facebook? Yeah, Instagram and Facebook. A request for what our fans would like to hear. Well, someone's going to do it. So, yeah. So I found out your new name for next episode. Oh yeah, Jonathan. Wait until the day of to think of topics, Roblox. That's that's pretty accurate. That's fair. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's jump in. Um, are these in any particular order? No. Okay. No. So from Desanto two on Instagram, each of your picks. Oh, each of you picks one beginner, intermediate, and advanced writing skill and explain how you learned it, why it's important, and when you use it. Brad, you get to go first. Yeah, give me no time to prep for this. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, you can take the out the intermediate and advanced <laughs> yeah, skills. Yeah, how about let's do that? How about you pick the beginner, I'll pick the intermediate, and, and Roblox will pick the advanced. That's more accurate. Going in, in order of writing experience. I'm saying because we should just do it by a, if you have three years or less. Get up on the mic, rookie. There's a ball sack on the mic. I thought I was close. Yeah. Enough. So you got it. There you go. Okay, come on. Beginner skill, huh? Yeah. You should know all of them. Yeah, that's pretty much everything I do. <laughs> <laughs> I would say how to back up a bike, but I no. wouldn't say he's qualified to say that he's learned that. Well, my record is improving. Oh, and two. <laughs> on gravel. <laughs> Yeah, that makes it better. Yeah, right? <laughs> I'm trying to think. Are we thinking in like solo writing or group writing or does it matter? It does Just a matter. writing skill. Yeah, a skill. Yeah. It can be group writing. It doesn't matter. I think the thing that for the beginner, the biggest thing for me to kind of pay attention to was just awareness. And I don't know if you classify that as a skill, but having never ridden before, it was really just the fact that I had to get used to really quickly being aware of everything on my surroundings at a hyper focus level. Yeah, you're a pretty shitty driver, so I'm sure that was pretty difficult to become a defensive driver. Yeah, and I've heard you say it a bunch of times that yeah. their driving skills improve when you ride. Yeah. And I feel like they've gotten marginally better. Hmm. Oh, marginally. A margin can be small. Yeah, yeah that's why I see. <laughs> I chose my words carefully. Um, but no, it'd probably be just awareness of everything because the mechanics and stuff I was able to kind of grab pretty early. But it was really just, okay, I've got to be aware of my scenarios. How am I going to react being able to think through some of that stuff in the moment? Um, leaving the Harley dealership after I got my slim and almost getting run off the road a mile away from the yeah. dealership. It's really just being aware of it because there was no signal. It's split second time to react. The beginner skill is you just really have to stay focused on what's going on around you. Yeah, because your 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 reaction time might be the same, but the time from when you choose to react to when your bike actually does that action yeah. can be longer if you are a beginner. And I think the how I learned it was well, how I learned a lot of stuff was I rode with you all the time. Yeah. And it was reacting to you first. It was kind of getting used to riding with somebody, but anytime I'd see you break, okay, when is he doing it? What was going on around it? Kind of looking at what caused you to do what you did and then picking up on some of that kind of stuff. Yeah, not only that, but you also had me on comms too. So I'd be, you know, talking about things that were happening around us. 
I was going to say my speed to competency on general writing skills was pretty quick because I had him on comms. We were being able to react to each other, guiding me through some of the stuff that you learned from what you wish you could have done differently kind of thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I think that played a big role in it, but that's probably the most important beginner skill. If I had to pick one of, you've got to make sure you train yourself to be aware. Yeah. Well, another beginner skill I think he may have learned is, go. <laughs> is you have the worst poker face man. <laughs> on a pet cock turning oh. your fuel on. Yeah. <laughs> yep. There it is. See, there's no you don't need to plan for this stuff. It's just, it's just yeah, I'm just that's just that's a skill that a lot of folks have trouble with. No. <laughs> Beginners, yeah. I mean, I mean they, don't yeah. Know, they don't know how to use a carburetor on a motorcycle. Yeah. Plus, no, there's no, I mean, there's not a, a pet cock on, on any vehicles. So, yeah. I mean, that's going to be a motorcycle-specific one. I was going to say, like, we got to realize, I didn't even touch anything outside of a bicycle on two wheels until three years ago. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, you can go ahead and say that. There you go. <laughs> All right. So, our intermediate skill. I am going to pick emergency braking. Okay. Because I feel like braking in general is kind of something that people aren't as good as they think they are at. Like, I mean, we've both seen, you know, kind of our lack of this skill when it comes into like, <laughs> you know, immediate stoplights and stuff like that. Boop. Yeah. Well, that was had nothing to do yeah. with braking. <laughs> no, he was already stopped. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I stopped pretty quickly. I didn't use my brakes, but I stopped pretty quickly. Um, <laughs> Yeah, 900-pound bagger will help you do that. Yeah. Hopefully <laughs> stop. No, but I think emergency braking is one of those things that people should practice a lot more than they do. Uh, and also, I mean, it's it's different for each bike, and it's different for each uh, type of riding. I mean, mm-hmm. Brad, you learned that very quickly, that the street braking does not transfer over to dirt. Yeah, it's, no. It's completely opposite. Yeah. On street, you want to be about 80% front, 20% rear, depending, I mean, from normal speeds that's your normal stuff and on dirt it's completely the opposite in once again in most situations um but yeah that's also one of those skills that could either save you or make you go down yeah i mean if a car pulls out in front of you and you're good at emergency braking and there's a chance you might save it if you're bad at emergency braking you're probably screwed yeah i think for me when harley started putting ABS on Mm -hmm. their bikes. It took me a long time to get used to having that ABS kick in and understand what it was actually doing to me. It feels so freaking weird when you're not used to it. So my tip for that is go out and feel it. Yep. Find where that, that kicks in. Yeah. And if you have never felt your ABS kick in, probably doing something wrong. Yeah. Because if you're emergency braking, you're going to be Or your hustle. <laughs> well, that bike stopped him. Yeah, fuck. <laughs> yeah, fuck you, hustle. I'm coming for you this episode. <laughs> He's been talking mad shit on the group chat this week, so. Um, Let's see what happens Monday. Oh, trust me, dude. I'm going to fuck him up. <laughs> <laughs> Any chance I get, he's getting a face full of sand. <laughs> I'm excited we have a new target. <laughs> um, from a advanced riding skill, I'm going to say um, counter leaning. Oh, yeah. Uh, That's one that I see people using incorrectly all the time. Yeah. And for me, I'll, I actually use it more often than I should. Yes, you do. Um, because I ride in the back of a group. And I can counter lean and get a little bit more vision around a corner. And that's when I'm typically doing it. Um, But understanding the push pull effect of your handlebars, especially if you have anything that's, I would say four inches, five inches or taller. So like any of your mini apes and stuff, you're going to have a little bit of a different. Oh um, yeah. When your words will change that a lot. Counter steering, counter leaning, and understanding how to actually place your body when doing it and when to and when not to, to your point, do it. So that's one of the things that it took me a while to get used to, but I have more fun and it lets me push the bike a little bit harder around corners. Yeah. So I'd be curious to see the difference because I've never had bars that are that tall. I've always had either stock or lowered ones, so it'd be interesting to see what that difference in the feel is. Yeah, it's quite a bit different, especially if you get up past... 
I would say you really start to feel it after like 10 inches. Yeah. Yeah. Like when I went for, well, not even, it could even be changing the design of the bars. Cause on my, on my, uh, my street bomb, I went from 12 inch mini apes to 12 inch T bars. And even that was completely night and day difference as far as how the bike responded to my actions. Yeah. Hmm. It's all, it's all physics and geometries and maths and stuff and and wizardry. Yeah. Magics. (laughs) All right. Next topic from C Monty 48 on Instagram, bad dealership experiences. (laughs) Where's Ken? (laughs) I know. I'm so sad that he's not here for this one. I'll just say it for him. Eh, Fuck Avelina. Or no, he uh, doesn't like Caliente. Caliente. Yeah. Fuck Caliente. There you go. Mine's Avelina. So that's, (laughs) All right, we'll have you kick it off. Okay. Uh, mine's definitely not to the extent of uh, Ken's just because I don't think I ever let it get to the point that Ken does. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ken will sit there and try to get as much out of a dealer as possible, and which, of course, leaves him to have as bad of an experience as possible. Me, on the other hand, I have just a little slight bad. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. I'm not, I don't let it get to that point. But my bad dealership experience was with Havelina Harley-Davidson, uh, it's just your stereotypical. Uh, I went in as a 22 year old. They treated me like okay, 22 year old. A 22 year old. Yeah, this kid has zero <laughs> money, and I mean they weren't far off from being wrong, but uh, you know just didn't give me the time of day. Didn't even try to work with me. And they they ran like one quote, and it was just. I mean they weren't working with me at all. So now that, that is mm-hmm. literally the extent. I've had pretty good, uh, pretty good luck as far as dealerships go, which is funny. Because their sister store, Green Harley Davidson, is great. I've had an amazing experience. Yeah, nearly every single time I've had to go up there. So I don't know. Maybe it's just the managers of the store provide a different culture. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah, I mean, even you can just walk in that st- into each dealership and feel the difference. Yeah, I mean, it's completely different. Plus, Havelina led me on to the whole yeah, let's partner up thing, and then they fucking ghosted like that. I remember that. They were I mean, all excited. They were then, handing me gear and setting and like introducing me to people and all that kind of stuff and then just whoosh, disappeared. I mean, just have the fucking balls to say, hey, we changed our mind. Yeah. I mean, I could have respected that a hundred times more. But just stop replying to emails and not answer calls and everything. I'm like, fuck you. <laughs> be a fucking man. <laughs> Even though it was a woman, but still be a fucking man. Be a man about it. Be a all fucking right. woman about it. Be rad. So I'm limited in my experience with dealers and the fact that I've only been dealing with motorcycle dealers for three years. But so I'm going to jump on the Ken bandwagon and say it's fuck Caliente, (laughs) Uh, but for very different reasons. Like they did something really good and then they just kind of irritated me because I'm really similar to Justin in that if I just get that bad feeling, I'm like, eh, all right, whatever. Yeah. Um, It's easy to do that in San Antonio because we have four dealerships within what, 30 miles. So give or take. Yeah. 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 We're, We're not like those people that are isolated. We, we have that option. Well, within what? four hours we have probably 12 dealerships yeah no so which in texas four hours is a day trip for for you folks up north i don't know how they (laughs) they treat a four-hour trip but for us that's that's just a day trip yeah yeah but so where caliente did good was they gave me more than i expected when i was trading in my rundown and beat up shadow yeah the one that we died on my way to your house before we went to God, Caliente. Jerry rigged the hell out of that thing. <laughs> just to get it running to get to Caliente and then we were praying that it was going to start for them to do the test ride. Yeah. It did. So they gave me on a couple hundred bucks more on the trade than I anticipated they would. So they did good on that part. But then we were there for what another 9 hours it felt God. like. So it I was think all day. It was an all day thing. We got there pretty early in the day and simple hey i'm getting rid of this i already knew what bike i had we knew it was on i had been on the phone with them they knew what we were getting and it was just my that sports there and we were there for i don't know another eight hours it was i want to say we got there around 10 30 and we were the last customers in the dealership yeah eight thirty nine o'clock yeah yeah and it was jesus they had everything there and destroyed their fucking feet so we were kind of irritated about that and they had some event going on that day so the reason i say that was just a bad experience other than just the time is the impression i got from them which leads to more of what ken's getting to is they are the only dealership i've been in um even our ones that we visited outside the area or outside the state that i walk in and when talking to people they just have the attitude of we're better than you like they i feel like they made me wait because they felt like they could 
Hmm. And it was, they knew it was my first Harley, my first experience with that. They had some other event going on. You're not as important. We'll get to you when we get to you kind of thing. Yeah. That's the impression that I got from them. And I have not gotten that from the two bikes I've bought from Cowboys, Hank, yeah. like phenomenal with everything. It's super fast and all that kind of stuff. So that was been my experience. It just took a full day. So yeah, mine's going to be the, since we all kind of did a good and bad, both of them are Harley Davidson's in Dallas. So I think it's Dallas Harley Davidson in Garland was phenomenal. HD of Dallas in Allen was a shit show. Is that the one we stopped at? Yeah. That's God one. damn, that was a shitty dealership. So that's the one on, that Trace and I got kicked out of their hog chapter. Mm-hmm. Uh, good old Panther Creek hog. Just putting that out there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and it really comes down to the dealer principle. So those are owned by the same corporate holding company, Ride Now, uh, Power Sports. Or something oh, like that. really? Yeah. Wow, that's a big dealership network because they it's have massive. a massive. They have a shit ton of like off-road stuff. Mm-hmm. Wow. So <laughs> the one that you know, I was a road captain for, and I was a chapter officer and everything. The guy wouldn't deal at all. He's like, "Well, I'm in a rich area." I'm going to charge MSRP plus on every single bike. The one in Garland's not in a rich area. (laughs) And, you know, I am a haggler and I'm like Ken. I go out and I will get everything I want and pay as little as possible to get it. Uh, But it also helps that I knew because I worked at Harley Davidson what that exact bike cost them. So... (laughs) The one in Allen screwed me around a bunch, and I went to Garland, and they gave me a bike for 1900 under MSRP plus a shitload of stuff, and they gave me a blind trade-in value on my bike. That was <laughs> phenomenal. Yeah. So it's it really comes down to if you're in a very ritzy area, probably don't want to go to that Harley shop. You want to go find one that's in that... In the ghetto. <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, in yeah. In the ghetto. <laughs> you, you want to go to one that's in more of a middle class, lower middle class area. Because they're not going to be selling bikes all the time to rich yuppies. Yeah. So they actually appreciate the business that you're bringing them. And the fact that you have a credit score that gets you into a topper, you know, a topper tier, topper no, tier, yeah. a no, higher, a it. higher tiered uh, credit, so that they can actually work with it. So yeah, there's this things like that, and that's my take on bad dealership experiences. It's the people make or break it, and if you have a shit manager, they're gonna have shitty people. So, all right. So basically one dealer might not even care and the other one's going to do everything they can to get you in the bag. Yes. Speaking of bags, let's take a second to hear from Nutsack. Nutsack is the only EDC bag the crew carries and for good reason. They're crazy and awesome. They get their name because folks said they had to be nuts to manufacture a man bag in America with American waxed canvas, American leather, and American labor. We want you to join us in the two-week challenge. Buy a bag from them, use it for two weeks, and if it doesn't completely change the way you carry your everyday gear, they will give you a full refund. We absolutely love ours, from carrying around extra mags for our concealed carry, to earbuds, sunglasses, vape stuff, and business cards. It is great having less shit in our pockets, and it was because of the nutsack satchels that we were able to be less weighed down. If you buy using our link, Nutsack will give you $5 off to enjoy a beer. Head over to nutsack.com slash B2W. That's N-U-T-S-A-C dot com slash B the number two W to get yours today. And we are back. So continuing on our list of fan chosen topics, this is actually coming (laughs) from a former guest of ours, Chris Moose. 
transcontinental transitioning trannies and their struggle to shift into their new self-identified lives as sportster owners. How the fuck do you get through that with zero problems, but you can't read a fucking intro? <laughs> Selective talent. God damn. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, we're, we're obviously not going to, to dive t- too deep into this. I just thought it was too gorgeous of a, of a question not to put it in here. And I also wanted to hear you read it, so. Yeah. I don't see the question, though. I think they just wanted us to talk about the transcontinental transitioning trannies. God, that's hard. I would say you had a little pause there. (laughs) All I'm saying is everyone makes mistakes. All right, next question is from Mike Gibson on Facebook. After group riding with an overnight stay, camping, slash hotel, slash Airbnb, et cetera, what's the beer What's the best beer, bourbon, drink, cigar to wind down with your buds and chill? I don't think they make one of those. No, I've never seen a cigar no. that's made with beer, bourbon, drink. <laughs> <laughs> I think we, we, we get the question. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, Brad. You're, you're kind of the, the resident expert alcoholic, so why don't you take this one first? Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, know your crowd. We're whiskey drinkers and things like that. So, for uh, for me, if it's one of those of you thinking about the best that's going to be cost-effective, you're either going to go with, with, like, Jameson from an Irish whiskey perspective, um, or I like Basil Hayden. That's actually one of mine. It's really in the the cheaper side of it, but it's going to be smooth. You get a good quantity for the price, and you can get a whole bunch of people pretty tipsy off of it for a pretty good price, but... That's what I would say. Get a good bourbon out there. Well, we had scotch in Big Ben and then a little cork sound. I think so. And it was like yeah. Johnny Walker Green. Something green it was Johnny Walker Green, yeah. Something like that, yeah. So I don't know, just know your crowd. Yeah. I'm not picky. Um, kind of to Brad's point, I don't uh, drink beer, but pretty much anything outside of that, uh, bourbon, whiskey, scotch is going to be my go-to. But like I said, I'm not super picky. Um, Dewar's scotch is like one of the cheapest ones out there and it's one of my go-tos I've also been on a a uh, Jack Daniels kick lately I mean I guess I'm finally getting down to my white trash roots but I don't know I also don't smoke cigars either that's more of a y'all two thing yeah your white trash roots don't come out until you get down to Kentucky Deluxe <laughs> oh no <laughs> <laughs> it's about the same price though <laughs> it's that difference between glass and plastic true uh, but I mean <sighs> If you went to a NASCAR race, you'd see a whole lot more Jack Daniels gear than you would. But don't they have a car racing mm, in NASCAR? They used believe. to. I don't think they can anymore. I don't know if uh-huh. they do. I don't think you can have any sort of alcohol or tobacco products. But don't they still have a Coors car? No. They haven't had a Coors car for a long time. Tells me how much I pay attention to NASCAR. Yeah. Make a left turn. <laughs> Make another one. <laughs> Y'all's redneck scores are just falling yeah yeah for sure no i'm an f1 snob so when (laughs) when i drink regularly um if it's summertime a good ipa would be the beer uh if it's fall winter early spring i'm gonna go with probably an oatmeal stout or a good chocolate stout something a little bit heavier you hipster no wonder you didn't fight my princess comment earlier (laughs) yeah (laughs) Um, I'm, I haven't really drank bourbon or any type of whiskey in a long time. So I'll, I'll just default to y'all. Yeah. Uh, drink for me, love a good, strong iced tea. Oh yeah. Or just water. (laughs) Usually if we're, if we're riding, we're riding in close to hundred degree weather. So yeah, Yeah. (laughs) Um, water's great. Cigar. My go-to cigar is a Camacho, um, Triple Maduro is usually my go-to. Is that the one you, we all bought? Yeah. Oh, he's, uh, he's fucking I don't remember speaking Latin we for all I know. I'll say, we <laughs> bought something last time, and I don't remember what it was, but that was a good one. Yeah, Camacho, Room 101, those are my go-to cigars. Good question, uh, Mike. That, yeah. That was a good one. Uh, keeping on the topic of group writing, this one is from Joshua Maurer on Facebook. He said, I'd love to hear how you guys got started in group riding. I've personally gone down every avenue and still haven't found the, quote, right fit as far as people who like to do the kind of riding I do. Best places slash ways slash groups to use, any apps or Facebook groups that you have created or used to get word out and organize group rides. I know you did a segment on planning the actual ride, 
but how about a segment on how to get a group together? So I'll go ahead and just kind of take the lead on this one because uh, our entire group minus Brad all met through the Texas Moto Meet. Mm -hmm. So I think, I mean, Facebook and everything is great, but I mean, as we've seen with our group rides, you get a lot of either very new riders or very unsafe riders or just assholes in general. Uh, but I would say just keep trying that. You might you might get lucky. Um, but the biggest thing I could say is go to events that you like. Yep. Uh, is just keep trying the different events, and eventually you'll meet someone, and then someone will meet the someone, and someone will meet the someone. Um, like I said, me, Uncle Ken, and Roblox all met at my uh, ride to the Texas Moto Meet. That was the first time we ever met in 2015, 2016? 16. 16. And, uh, I mean, we've just been riding together ever since. So I would say don't give up on it. Uh, just keep trying. I mean, I haven't used any of the apps or anything like that. Uh, I know depending on the area you're in, those can be very good or very bad. Uh, but, yeah, like I said, Facebook, Facebook events, um, dealer shows, all that kind of stuff. I would suggest if you're in a city environment, go to a motorcycle-friendly bar and park your bike next to bikes similar to yours it sounds goofy as shit but, it does yeah um in dallas there's a restaurant called blue goose it's like a mexican joint but they always have bike nights like every week they have a bike night so i went up there once on my crotch rocket didn't know anyone up there i wasn't even legal to drink and just went up there parked and just started talking to people and there was a bunch of guys my age and we just all started riding and just continued that and then i was also in a car club that the guys started riding so i kind of built that from there but honestly if you're on a harley or actually any bike go to a hog dinner ride if you want to get in a feel just go out there it's free you'll have to sign a waiver if you're not a member for liability stuff but they have guided routes to a restaurant or maybe to well almost all hog events deals with food or it ends at a food location yeah so typically your saturdays are going to be a nice long pretty leisure lunch ride sundays they'll probably have a lunch ride uh, once a month or so but go out there and find people and don't be an ageist just yeah I think that's a good point. Understand that you may be the youngest one in your group. That isn't going to, it's not going to change the fact that you have a group of people who like to go ride. I mean, what there's between the youngest and oldest in our group, there's what, like a 12, 20, 20 year difference. Hasso and you. Hasso's 48. Pretty close. Oh God. (laughs) You're you're just being an asshole. Uh, I think (laughs) he's like to both of us. (laughs) I think he's 42. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds about right. So that's math. 16. 16. Yeah. 16. I mean, that's a good, I mean, that, our age group can, or our age difference can drive. So yeah, yeah. I think that, I think that's a good point. Yeah. And that, that's what it really comes down to. When I first got out of the military, I was at Starbucks and saw a big group of Harleys ride by, hopped on my bike and kind of just tagged along and we ended up at a bar. And that's actually where I met Tracy and her uh, her ex husband. But uh, but yeah, I was the youngest rider by probably fifteen twenty years. Yeah, uh, and, and you're gonna get that in the Harley community. Period. Yeah, I would say you're gonna get that in the Harley community a lot more than any other community. Yeah, and l- unless maybe ADV, <laughs> ADV is might be up there. Okay. So that's that's yeah. how I got into it. You know, when I was on Crotch Rockets, you know, just you know, the swarm of pissed off hornets driving down a uh, highway and got in, you know, when I bought my Harley, got into the Bahrain hog chapter and actually learned what a group ride was supposed to be and what a formation looked like and all that good stuff. And it really just comes down to experience. But yeah, to your point, Justin, scour Facebook for your area. People post rides all the time. Yep. It may not be the ride you want to go on, but it may be the an people. opportunity for you to go meet people who can then show you some of the routes that they like. Yeah. And you 
strike up a friendship. I'll say in my less than realistic for everybody out there in the real world is be best friends with an up and coming YouTube star. Yeah. Yeah. That'll, that'll do it. That's how I got into it. That, I mean, that was a generous compliment there, but that's a great, great thing. So I would say, uh, yeah, maybe, uh, listen to some podcasts or something. And if you're really cool, you should enter some giveaways. Yep. Yep. Speaking of giveaways, um, for everyone who donates $20 to Project Clean Slate, you will be entered into a drawing to receive a set of Advent Black Color Match Stretched Saddlebags. Now, we are limiting this to only 500 entries, and if you want your name entered more than once, donate an additional $20 for every entry you would like. And remember, if you don't win, you can rest assured the money is going to a great cause, and it is a tax write-off. Head over to BetweenTwoWheels.com. The two is spelled out T-W-O. Click the Project Clean Slate link and donate today. Thank you for that uh, tea up there, buddy. Yeah, you're welcome. Speaking of tea, uh, from Pirateering C on Instagram, T or A? Yes. Tea. You're, you're straight up T, huh? I'm, I'm a yes, but if I have to choose. Huh. No, I'm yes, both. You have no preference whatsoever. No, I don't care. Zero. None. Nothing. Why why are you a team man, Brad? I don't know. It's just one of those where you just, they make me happy. (laughs) (laughs) Boobies make me smile. Wow. Uh, Hey, they both get, yeah. So you guys are going to have to guess which one I am in three, two, one. Booty. Hey. Yep, absolutely. Hey, I'm not against teas by any mean, but this is how I, I, because I, I, I was kind of on, on your page, Roblox. Like, I was like, I, I like both. I am, I'm a fan of both. But I can date, or I guess I should say, I could have dated a woman with no T. I cannot date a woman with no A. And see, for a long period of time there, I suffered of yellow fever and only went after Asian yeah. girls. So they had no A at all. Or T, usually. Some see, of them. You're yeah. making me yeah. go back through my history, and my history is they have a lot more A. Oh, see, there Which you go. is interesting. Hmm. Yeah. My, my three things I look for, eyes, lips, and hips. Yeah. That's. Yeah. Eyes are up there. My, my theory is if A, A is, I mean, of course you can work on everything like that, but most of it is based off of just general shape and genetics. T, if you're not happy, or I should say if the woman's not happy, that's a $5,000 fix. I mean. People spend that much on their trucks every day. God-given talent versus man-made talent. God bless plastic surgeons. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Making miracles happen. <laughs> See, this is why I wanted to do this question. This is why I picked this one because I knew it, it'd have some gold in it. Oh, that's good. Uh, okay. Are, is that the last one, really? Yeah, we kind of blew through them. I mean, I've got some other ones on here if we want to extend the time a bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We're okay. Impromptu questions. Let's go ahead and uh, cue the, the Jeopardy music. I was going to start with. Don't do it, Brad. Please to. don't. No. I'll fucking murder you. Because I, I really do like the uh, the closing argument you came up with. Good. I'm pretty dope at him. No, I'm not writing them for you. <laughs> I was going to say. A lot of them, I, let me see. A lot of them were over the, we should do the dealer show, but... Um, we already did that, so that's the problem with going behind. Oh, here's a good one uh, from Bearded. Sorry, I can't read your full name because it's already been closed, but uh, actually, hold on. Nope. New versus used touring bikes for the first time. For the first time, Bagger Rider. What can you afford? I was going to say, I went yeah. used. I'm a first-time bagger rider, and I went used and got a great deal. It was something I got everything I could possibly have wanted on it, and yeah. it's literally the best thing I could have done. I I mean, I always advise going used just because, you know, everyone knows the second you drive it off the lot, you lose, you know, X percent or whatever. Um, but, I mean, if you can get a good deal on a new, why not? <clears throat> Roadblock. <laughs> Hey, I've I've been very lucky on my bikes, but I've I've actually never purchased a used motorcycle. So for me, I I'm really hard on my bikes. And 
I know that whoever got my bikes after I traded them in probably had some issues with them later on. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's just nature of the beast. And I don't want to take that risk. I like having the longer warranty and that extra peace of mind of, okay, if something happens, it it's going to be fixed and not, I'm not going to come out of pocket for it. And just all the unknowns, that's my personal preference. But if you really want to ride a bagger, but you don't have the money for a used or a new one, go with the used one. It's fine. Um, I would suggest if you are going used, get an extended service plan on it um, just to help you out. Just in case. Uh, I'd say a lot of it's the right time, right place, too, because, like, we went in. I wasn't even looking for a bagger. We had a bunch of other problems, and the guy was not Roadblock who owned this bike before because this bike was babied. It had, like, very <laughs> few miles on it for being six years old. Everything was still yeah, pretty good. How many miles did that bike have on it? 5,200. 5,200, and it was a 2013? 2013. Yeah, 5,200. Ridiculous. So I was like, <laughs> right place, right time. So that literally just fell into our fucking lap. We went in there for parts. Yeah. We were like, oh shit. <laughs> and parted with the bike and got a new one. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That was a stretch. A little bit. <laughs> That's sad. So I got another one for right here from Cameron Yax. Sorry, I know that's not your full name, but that's all I can see. Uh, it says, I want to hear your thoughts on the best non Harley cruisers. Would be interesting from a Harley rider's perspective. We kind of did this on a previous episode. Unfortunately, we still have not gotten to ride any of them except one or two, two or three. Um, but I think the BMW K six K sixteen hundred K sixteen hundred B K sixteen hundred B won the stat shootout. Yeah. Now, once again, we have not gotten to ride that one. Uh, we did get to ride the Indian Chieftain as well as the Indian Springfield, Springfield, and then the Indian Chieftain Dark Horse. Um, I guess that wouldn't count as import, though, would it? Did he say import or not? Non-Harley. Oh, he said non-Harley, yeah. yeah. Um, but, yeah, that's – unfortunately, until we get to ride those, I don't feel comfortable of deeming an absolute winner. Um, what, do you, what do you think, Roblox? From a cruiser standpoint, mm-hmm. I'm going to give it to Indian, period. Okay. Um, I – do not like how Honda's cruisers look, okay. and I don't like Yamaha or Suzuki's. I liked the Yamaha's look. That bike at Kent is still for sale, by the way. They have it marked down to like sixteen nine or something like that. Jesus! I had Brad still on it to feel how heavy it was because oh, he didn't believe a- me that it was just as just as heavy, if not. I think that came in heavier than the Road Glide actually. Yeah, it felt heavier. Yeah. It's like thirty pounds heavier, but yeah. Um, so yeah, from from an overall cruiser standpoint, I those are the ones now is the triumph rocket considered a cruiser i would say so then that would be the non-indian harley choice yeah so i think it just looks really good yeah i wouldn't say it's a touring bike but i would say it's a cruiser yeah i wouldn't put it in no no, any other not touring yeah i wouldn't put it in any other category though yeah so from a cruiser perspective roblox saying indian and I have to say Indian as well just because that's the only other one I've ridden. Yeah. And I think we were both in agreement. Actually, I think all three of us were in agreement that both Harley and Indian had the pros and cons. There was no clear winner between right. the two. Indian had some better things. Harley had some better things. Okay. Yep. I, won't, I had that shadow for a very short period of time. Didn't mind it until I had some other issues with it. But seeing your guys' videos, having not ridden any of them, I'd probably go with the Chieftain just i mean the look of it and the fact that you guys were raving yeah as much as you could about it yeah from a test ride i mean if i had to choose between like a road king or the springfield mm-hmm. i'd actually go with the springfield i hmm. thought it just felt a it lot handled better. a lot better yeah yeah it was definitely and it had more power it felt like it had more power hmm. now i think it that one did have a bigger engine it did yes yeah it was stage three i believe yeah yeah so but, that would make sense but yeah, I just I, the styling, it's very American, mm-hmm. and yeah, yes, it's got that old Americana feel to yeah. it. Yeah, and yes, y- everyone knows my opinion on Indian when it comes to um, ripping off Harley Davidson. But oh, I thought you were gonna bring up the fenders. I was gonna say oh, that's, that's what I was waiting for. <laughs> the fucking front fender. <laughs> I'm not a fan either. It's just, it's just ugly, <laughs> fucking ugly. But uh, but yeah, I just. Nothing against Honda, Suzuki, or Yamaha, Kawasaki. I just don't yeah. like the st- the way they look. They look 
like a poorly done American hack. Yeah, I agree. It's it's what you would expect Asian designers to think American bikes look like. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they've only seen a few on TV and they're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't like the feel of the one you had me sit on. It can't, like, I mean, heavier. Oh, yeah, the Yamaha. This, this, was this, it the, the in, intruder, yeah. I believe? Yeah. It, it just felt like there was so much from when my hands were, there was so much more bike in front of me. It literally, yeah. it just felt weird. Yeah. I mean, the Gold Wings are, I mean, there's there's no doubting it. They are excellent bikes. I yes. Mean, there's a reason why. I would say like 90% of <laughs> police forces are going towards them. And we all know that they probably are the best bike for just crushing miles. But to your point, I hate the way they look. I think they are pretty damn ugly. Yeah. All right. So Give moving us one on. One more. One more. One all more. right. This is a, I really wanted to cover this one because I feel like we're going to have different opinions on it. Uh, this one is from Jason Babcock on Facebook. He says, I think there is a lot of newer riders that don't understand the benefits of counter steering over leaning. In addition, if you cover my topic, that will give me something to talk about on my new channel. Hashtag rock bucket motoring. Shameless plug there. I appreciate the, I always plug. I appreciate the, uh, the hustle there, Jason. Also, we have a, a street in San Antonio named after your last name. Babcock. <laughs> you said cock. There it is. <laughs> so the, he said the difference between counter steering and leaning, not counter leaning, but leaning. Okay. So this is the same oh, thing. Okay. We have the same opinion then. Okay. So, uh, unless he, he, unless he meant counter leaning and counter steering, but the way it's written made me think just regularly. Well, so, I, I love cruise control because mm-hmm. I don't have to have my hands on the bars. Correct. And I will lean my bike into turns without my hands on my handlebars. Correct. But if we're going through the twisties, my hands are on my bars, it's both lean action and counter steer to get the bike to go where I want to go. If I need to dip it down harder, I'm going to push more into the handlebar because, again, that push-pull effect but maybe I'm not understanding the question. Well, but those two are the same other than one's in the hips and one's in the wrists. I'm wondering if this I, is what we recently had when we were thinking about we were up in Arkansas, right? And then we finally started uncovering why Hasso felt he was having struggles because Ken was calling him out for not doing any sort of leaning whatsoever in any of these turns. Mm-hmm. And Hasso was saying, oh, I don't get it, what you guys are doing. He was never putting his head over the mirror or anything. Everything was in the bars and he was keeping himself rigid. I'm wondering if that is kind of what he's getting at is what's the difference of just doing everything in the bars Mm -hmm. or actually doing a combination of moving your body to fit the turn. I would say that that's, that's probably a good option. Uh, the only other thing I could think of is if you're leaning, you're counter steering. If you're counter steering, you're leaning at in some way, you're leaning the bike. You yourself may not be leaning. Correct. And in that situation, you're not getting that bike over as far as you could. Correct. And I think with newer riders, I don't think they're counter steering with purpose. Mm-hmm. I feel like as riders progress, like for me, I know if I push my right handlebar out, I need to to lean right. That's I mean, that's it's complete opposite of, you know, a bicycle or hell, even even dirt bikes. Mm-hmm. I mean, unless you get up to pretty good speed, but I think leaning with intention mm-hmm. is yeah. yeah. Because I think a lot of people will do one or the other and not incorporate it, kind of like like you were saying with, with Hasso. It took me some time to get used to it, especially as my bikes got bigger and the weight distribution Correct, is different. Yeah. You have to make sure, like, I'm still not fully used to where I have to position my body on the bagger. Um, I'm also the smallest guy in the group, so mm-hmm. my I don't have as much weight to distribute on that kind of thing. But my slim, it was centered so perfectly, I could throw my body anywhere I wanted and feel in complete control of that. So it was weird to see. I didn't feel as in control in certain turns on the Sportster. 100% felt control on the Slim. And I'm still learning after. You're what, on the opposite end of the spectrum now with yeah. the heavier bike as opposed to the super light Sportster. Yeah. So I'm really having to get into and just that mental, okay, what am I doing here? Why am I doing this? What's what's the purpose of it? So yeah. I think you're leaning with intent is a big one. And I found myself coaching Hasso through it. Yeah. The last time we got separated and I was on the comms, it's, yeah, it's scary when I'm coaching someone how to ride. <laughs> 
But well, um, I was like a mile and a half ahead of y'all at that point. Yeah, so. you just <laughs> were gone. But then he goes and nicknames himself Shredder after it. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> fucking dumbass. <laughs> but I think that's the biggest thing that kind of made me realize I had to pay attention to it because he didn't even realize he wasn't doing it mm-hmm. until we called him out on it. Yeah, I think learning where your hands at need to be in in conjunction with your body is something that newer writers struggle with. And the quicker you figure that out, the quicker you're going to become a better writer. And I go back to, I think it's the bike you pick. Cause like I said, switching to the slim, it was instant for me. I felt so much more comfortable doing that than I did on the sportster before or the shadow before that. Well, I think it's all just, I mean, your Mechanics center, are the same, your center of gravity is going to be different. Yeah. But your, your writer triangle was different. It might yeah, shorten the time frame it takes to learn or actually feel comfortable with it. Cause that's what yeah. mine was. It just shortened that time frame. I was much more comfortable a lot faster. See, I think most people when they're getting on a bagger for the first time and actually riding it, they're scared of the extra weight. Yeah. That just sits in their mind. Like, okay, if I lean too far over 900 pound motorcycle is going to fall on me and they don't realize how much lean angle they actually have with the touring bikes and it's all physics yeah <laughs> and that's where i think the difference because i didn't really necessarily care about the overall weight it's just how it felt with the fixed fairing versus mm-hmm. the mine like it wasn't until i was at a certain point of the turn where the bike obviously because it's not a fixed fairing the weight distributes i think that's where i was like oh crap it wasn't yep, just that goes. the overall mental block it's mm-hmm. depending on the bike you're riding because um, the little bit I rode, oh, somebody's rode or rode glide, it felt a little different. But I think that was my biggest aha uh, was I was fine with the bike until I got into one turn and it was a tighter turn and then I felt that fairing start to go. Yep. That's when I kind of, oh crap. I, mean, I had to pull back a fast bit. enough. Also true. Because <laughs> <laughs> if your wheel's going like this, you're not counter steering at that point. So. Yeah, so <laughs> my first ride on the bagger was the Twisted Sisters. Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. if I can go big or go home, pussy. Hey, I made it, and I wasn't <laughs> the last one in the group either. So, so for this, you can control your bike 95% with one hand. Yep. Mm-hmm. So if you, once you're, at, you know, if you're in third gear, and you just have your hand on your throttle and your other hand's off, you can go e- any way you need to. I do that quite a bit. Yeah. And I mean, GP riders can reach down and just touch the ground. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> with their face, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's move into the closing argument. And again, I, I love how you wrote this one. Do you think that social media as a whole is helping or hurting the overall biker community? why or why not and since you're the sucker who took ken's spot this episode you get to go first <laughs> this, would, this would be good because we've got people who have you know only known the social media you've got people who know kind of both sides and you've got people who know both sides with a heavier leaning towards the old school method i mean you're fucking retarded you're old i'm 36 okay what were you fucking posting up group rides on MySpace? <laughs> yeah. AOL chat rooms? Actually. Oh, fuck off. <laughs> All right, Brad, go. You're online. Um, I'd have to say my limited experience is kind of more, I think it helps um, in thinking that, A, just seeing how we've been able to get our group of friends coming really from your YouTube channel, which opened up a lot of doors from your meets and different things like that. But even just my most recent experience of being able to get a dirt bike in the span of like a week. Yeah. Like, I, all I did was social media, the marketplace, things like that. You can interact with people different, right? Hmm. Um, so I think it helps it in the sense of there's a lot more awareness. Um, I do think you have the negative side of social media that exists regardless of topic. If you're going to have the trolls, yeah. you're going to have the negative concepts. But I think that's that spans every demographic of social media, not just the biker community. Absolutely. So if you take that with the understanding that that's no matter what you do, I don't think it's necessarily hurting the biker community on its like on its own. So I think you get more of the benefit of the fact that if I do were to move somewhere and wanted to find a new group, I'm going to go scour Facebook for these group rides. I'm going to go look for the hog chapter postings on their social media or their websites. Um, so I think it helps for awareness. I think it helps create the community of, hey, I'm in a, I'm in a bind. I got to sell my bike or I need to get a bike. It makes it a lot easier to do that kind of stuff. So I think for getting people on two wheels who are interested in it, marketplace and stuff like that's a big win because you can shorten that time frame and get people comfortable to do that. But also, it's just gonna, it, you have everything at your fingertips of what's around me, what's available, timing. I can work around my schedule to go ride or go meet with people potentially. Hmm. I, I'm, it's so interesting that you took it to a 
a buying and selling standpoint because I had I didn't have that in mind at all. But it's a great point. It's the um, the buying options are much bigger than yeah. they would be otherwise. Okay. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Uh, I kind of have to agree with a lot of your points. I think that um, I think a big point that you nailed home is if you understand that that negative side of Facebook or any social media is going to be there regardless. I mean, you can have a, a pony group and if someone's like, if you don't bite your pony, then you're an asshole. Like, <laughs> or if you bite your pony is your pony should get taken away. Hashtag Louis CK always cite your sources kids. But, uh, I mean, yeah, if you can get past that, I definitely think that just like with everything, it's just helping people connect. I will say, however, that it is changing the term that I picture when I think of quote unquote biker community, um, because it is opening the door to a lot more different people as opposed to in the old days, you were only going to get those people that were outgoing and social to, you know, get in these groups and go on these rides. And like, like you were talking about Roblox of just going and following a group of bikers, like I would never fucking do that in my life. I'm so antisocial and so awkward. There's not a chance in hell that I would do that. When I had my sport bike, I never rode with anybody else because I didn't want, or I didn't have that, you know, I don't want to say courage, but I didn't have that desire to go and meet other sport bike riders. Yeah. But if, you know, Facebook groups were a thing back then, it might've been different and they probably were, but they weren't as big as they are now by any means. So it's helping the biker community, but I would say it's also changing the biker community, whether that's in the positive or minus, that's up to interpretation, but that's my thought. I look at it as nothing but a win for the biker community Okay, because it's growing it and it's growing it in a way that kicks out the one percenter perception and it, it's a it, good point. It yeah. has it has created different clicks, but you're going to get that no matter what. Correct. Uh, but the communication aspect of letting people know, you know, bikes are down. You know, check on your buddies. That type of thing. How many do we see? from just the two one zero on twos or whatever the fuck it is. Probably like three or four a week. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so just that it's mass communication. It lets people know of events that they probably yeah. would have never heard about. And I think the big thing is it gets new styles and new concepts out faster. Cause back in the day you'd have to wait for low rider or not lower uh, bagger magazine or some, other chronicle to come out for you to be able to see oh what's happening on the west coast from a style perspective what's going on the east coast and then everything else once again a viewpoint i would have never thought about but now i mean on instagram you see you just get a couple hashtags going you're gonna see a few thousand pictures of bikes from across the world global exactly and that's it's making a very small close knit community massive and with that you have downfalls yeah but the pros definitely outweigh the cons i think you bring up a good point with the style aspect of it because just thinking about back in the day of course i obviously my i don't have any experience in that but just seeing the reaction to your how to's and some of your videos of what you do it's making and i think it's improving the do-it-yourself confidence absolutely with making people more willing to start like myself i'm not mechanically inclined i just did not grow up that way it's nothing i ever really got into so yeah y'all make fun of me all the time but hey i don't have the background y'all do right but it's giving people like me with an interest to potentially say hey i want to learn this i can go watch a 10 minute video on how to install a light or do something like that i think that's another aspect of it's really getting that individual community of hey i'm going to make my bike my own yeah and have the confidence to do that I think that changes a lot of it too. Yeah, absolutely. Because I would have never, ever done my first build series if it wasn't for YouTube, which is a form of social media. I thought you were crazy taking that bike down to the <laughs> frame. Like I remember you buying it, and then like within a couple of weeks, it was taken apart, yeah. and I'm like, "You're insane." Yeah, and then with the, I mean, for the Sportster build, I looked up how to do everything before I even considered doing it. I had every single video of everything I wanted to do, and I was like, "It's just nuts and bolts. I can do this." 
And then, of course, with the Dyna and the Ultra, there wasn't really much. <laughs> I mean, the, the Ultra is a little bit more complicated because it's, you know, had a lot of stuff that I'd never seen before. But with those two builds, I mean, just with that small amount that I learned, I mean, it starts, you know, compounding exponentially your knowledge. Yeah, and it's the snowball effect. Yeah, though. definitely. And then with, with those platforms, I'm able to give back and create more content and make that stuff more accessible and better videos than you see out there of, you know, other than Jim Bob out there in his garage with his fucking cell phone shooting in vertical mode, like a fucking savage. But yeah, just anything I can do to, to help that it drives and it, not just me, but anybody doing how to's. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I use that lighting one because that was my example. Y'all kind of laugh when I said, Hey, I did my light myself, but it was a three minute video on YouTube and boom, yep. done. Yeah. Certified YouTube mechanic. And it's it's nice because you can crowdsource information. Yes, mm. that's that's mm-hmm. a big one. Oh yeah, crowdsourcing for sure. Um, I mean, for us, if we have a question, we can hit up John Maxwell. Yep. In Georgia, and it's it's you know a couple seconds to get a response before you'd have to send an email or call or whatever, and it just call <laughs> and leave a message on his answering machine and hope that he got it and yeah. hope that he calls back or has your number. Yeah. Yeah, and then the long distance charges oh, and all that. Yeah. yeah, social media. Again, back to my my point is it's it's helped so much more than it has hurt, and I think the people who dislike it or who make the comments that oh your channel's hurting the biker community or whatever they're the old okay. people <laughs> who don't like change. Yeah, they don't Sorry. grasp the concept of social media and they don't understand that not not everyone should have the same opinion on something yeah you know different opinions are okay yeah and it's it creates conversation yeah that's why i don't know if you guys saw the 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 comments on my on my dirt bike video but i had a conversation with a guy he said uh, I hope you get that because I showed the the rendering for the new new dirt bike, and he said I hope you get it really dirty to to cover up that that puke render. And then he just went on with how it's a a big pet peeve of him seeing or a big big pet peeve of his seeing someone or someone that I influence spending money and then cry the first time it gets it gets wrecked. So I was like, okay, let's let's. Let's strike up a conversation. Yeah, let's know? dissect I this. I, I didn't want to just go full on Ken blunt force trauma. I was like, okay, so explain to me how does something that has zero effect on you, how is that a pet peeve of yours? And he responded in a very tactful way saying, I, I don't know. It's just my opinion. I see something like this and I just don't like it. And when he, what, the way he, I mean, he put it a little bit differently than I just did, but the way he put it made me understand. It's like, oh, okay. So it's like me when I see, Camaros with Transformers badges. It affects me in zero way. It's not my car. It's not my money. It's not my appearance, but it irks me. Yeah. You so, think it looks stupid. Yeah. I think it looks really fucking stupid, <laughs> but I mean, that's their car. That's their thing. I think the difference in me though, is like, I would never go up to someone or go on a YouTube video and be like, yo, your Transformer badge is fucking stupid. See, I think that's the biggest thing. It's like, you have to be able to get through that. So the fact that you didn't go full blunt force trauma allowed you to have that conversation and understand the perspective, which is, I think that's a whole different tangent for a different day of that's yes. what's wrong with people nowadays. Yes. Is they're so willing to go say your transformer badge looks stupid, but the second someone asks a question of tell me why or reacts, all of a sudden it's this big thing. Like, yeah. no, It's like louder with Crowder. I mean, he, he, I think he, you know, highlighted it better than anybody else on the entire internet of just let's sit down and have a conversation about the difference of opinions. Yeah. And at the end of it, you're not going to walk away worse than you were before. I don't know when our society changed having an opinion on your own into that means you're wrong. 2012 when the world ended. You should look that up. It's probably the most valid one. Fuck with your brain, man. Thank you for tuning in to Between Two Wheels podcast. To see the show notes for this and all of our episodes, to find links to our social media and Patreon page where we are raising money for Project Clean Slate, head over to our website at www.betweentwowheels.com. The two is spelled out T-W-O. On behalf of Justin, Uncle Ken, I am Johnny Roblox saying, be yourself unless you're a jerk. Then be someone better. Peace. I, I, I've been dead, dude.